Hi, welcome. You're at our Microbiomes for All webinar two. And um, we'll turn it right into our facilitators, knowing that all the links for today um, will be posted into PATH LMS, which is our learning management system. Um, and I'll post links in the chat as well as we go. Okay, thanks for being here and I'll see you at the end. Uh, hi everyone, um, uh, welcome back. And um, we'll go ahead and, and get started. I just uh, find what I was sharing a moment ago. Okay. Slideshow. What was that? Went to your slideshow. Where the hell is it? There it is. <laughs> um, all right, great. So we're going to continue on um, into the data analysis pipelines. And uh, again, this is just kind of the, the brief uh, overview, and we'll get to looking at alpha and beta diversity and relative abundances and, and so forth. Um, and uh, we're just gonna, uh, Davida, this is just kind of like a raise your hand or kind of thumbs up type thing. So we wanted to ask, we know a couple of you have tried um, uploading FASTQ files to Nefeli. Anyone give that a shot? You can even put it in the chat if you want, just let us know how you managed. I think that, you know, um, it, it's a great, even if you're just doing it with the files that we provide, just replicating what we've done here, it, it's good because uh, things don't always work the same on different platforms, different browsers, so on and so forth. So um, if you catch like little glitches or little hangups, uh, we can, you know, maybe we can find, we can either know what the answer is or we can crowdsource the answer for you. Anyways, um, I'm... yeah, it looks, looks like they're getting there. Sometimes as well, when we've tried this with classes and um, individual computers, just for whatever reason, just don't work for whatever reason, and you just have to keep trying, and then it works all of a sudden. So it's just no harm to just try it because if you can't get the files in, you'll be stuck at first principles. So and so... yeah, uh, I'm I'm not more. I don't know. I can't see the chat but uh any luck with outputs or log file locating the log files it looks like everybody's a couple of people have tried not everybody's tried and um, most people have used what what you provided theo um, and okay. and then gina is offering some winzip or seven zip uh, to open the files in the chat okay great all right um anyway so i'll, I'll continue on and um if you know if you raise your hand i can see that uh, uh it's hard for me to have too many windows open. So right now my chat window isn't open. Um, Davida, what are we, is this what the people posted last week? Yeah, so this is just, we cleaned it up a little bit for y'all. So um, uh, it's kind of neat. We have, a, we have a lot of themes, no matter how many times you do this webinar, that people seem to want to do the same things. And some for some reason, you're all very obsessed with fish guts. I don't quite know why. Easy to come by. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And um, but it's kind of neat. So you can all see that you're all working kind of in similar things. So we we said this last year. We actually we didn't do it last year, but we we really do need to get this going this year is to have more focus kind of subgroups of you all working on various sample types because that would be neat. So keep an eye out for us. And um, you'll be getting emails from us from the newsletter. We're going to try and send it the newsletter um today, if not today, tomorrow. Um, and it'll go to you all. And if you have any interest in joining like a, 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 a sample type specific group, uh, even just a learning community, let us know and we'll be able to arrange that for you. But that's just have a look there and see the diversity of samples. But Theo has good advice here, Theo, with respect to low yield samples, if you want to just let them know. Oh, yeah. So uh, I can't remember if I uh, touched on this um, when we met previously, but um when I've done this in class, and if you open it up to students, they're like, well, some of the things that have high hits are they want to swab money or door handles or bathrooms. Um, those kind of uh, are really appealing to them for some reason. Um, but there's not a whole lot of uh, microbial life on any of those surfaces. And so because they're low, I mean, you can do them. I'm not saying that you can't, but because there is uh, so little material there, the risks of contamination um, 
get higher because if you know if you only have a little bit of DNA and you have a, some contaminating DNA, then that contaminating DNA, relatively speaking, makes up a larger fraction. Whereas if you start with um, soil or a, or a pond water sample or something else that's kind of heavily loaded, um, then you know you've got more DNA there, and if there is a little bit of uh, contaminant that usually gets uh, drowned out. Um, one of the ways that you can go around that with these low uh, low uh, yield samples is to pool multiple swabs. So instead of just doing like one swab of door handles, have students uh, each you know swab 20 different door handles and put all those swabs in one 50 mil falcon tube and extract your DNA from, from that kind of pooled sample, um, that can boost your yield. So uh, yeah, but that's just from, from our experience. All right. Um, so uh, again, this is kind of like the, the uh, crow's eye view or bird's eye view of um, the microbiome uh, uh, research pipeline. And we're kind of jumping in here where the arrow is um, looking at um, microbiome data once we have these uh, 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 fast Q files. And um, before I jump into this, I wanted to kind of backtrack a little bit uh, to what we were discussing last week. So let me um, switch out of here and jump to... Uh, Nefeli. Oops. So um, hopefully many of you were able to create accounts on Nefeli. And obviously, if, if you've made some progress with uploading FASTQ files and so forth, you, um, you must have probably created an account. Um, and as I mentioned last week, the Nefeli divides things into kind of three major pipeline or sets of pipelines, and that's the pre-processing, the analyze, and the explore. And the data two that we'll talk about in a minute is analyze, because that's what we're going to kind of move into analyze and explore today. But I did want to go back um, to pre-processing just for a couple minutes, because um, if you remember... Um, when we were talking last week, that depending on where your samples come from, uh, they may uh, already have been um, gone through this step. So they may have been quality checked, they may have been trimmed, uh, adapter sequences removed, uh, chimeras removed, and they may have been merged. And so I didn't run through all those steps uh, because um, like I said, our data has already, uh, when it comes from the sequencing uh, company that we're using, already has gone through those steps. But I did want to take a second to show you uh, what that looks like. Um, if I can find the right folder. Okay. People can still see my screen, right? So I think I'm looking in the folder that everyone has access to, and you might have noticed that I put in another one there that says a demo QC trim, okay? So if you go through that QC pipeline like we did last week um, and upload the mapping file and, and, and link it to your data, this is what you'll get if you actually trim primers um, and so, uh, and, um, do the uh, uh, quality filtering. And you'll notice that there are a number of uh, files here. There's trim, there's cut adapt. These are two of the um, pathways that Nefeli uses in kind of cleaning up the data and it creates uh, a file for those. Uh, but it also creates a merged file with, and, and it kind of does these steps sequentially. So if you're looking for, if you really need to do the trimming and the quality checking because your data is coming in you know, really raw um, and you run this, your outputs are gonna look like this in the folder. And uh, when you go on to, to move forward to the next steps, you'll wanna use the um, output sequences that are in the merged folder because 
uh, what the process is doing is that it I mean because you'll see that there are also um, uh, fastq files in the in the trimmed and the cut adapt uh, folder but because it does the steps one after another the the last step that you want is in the merged folder okay um, so just let me pause for a minute and make sure I can kind of go through it again from from you know starting if in the felly if people think that would be useful but I just did want to show people an example of what the outputs would be um, if you actually were doing more of the actual QC yourself. Does this make sense to everyone? Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> anyways, if if other questions come up, we can we can do that. Um, so, like I said, we're going to. Um, try to uh, do the analysis with uh, data two. And so I will uh, jump in and show you uh, how that works. Um, and I'm gonna go back here. And so I'm gonna go now to the analyze step. And in this case, we're doing amplicon uh, metagenomics. We're doing amplicon sequen sequencing or our, our data, our sequences of 16S amplicons. Uh, there are pathways for if you're doing a, a whole um, uh, metagenomic uh, kind of shotgun uh, sequencing or viral genomics, but today we're gonna focus on the amplicon uh, pathways. And there's a couple options here. Um, we usually use uh, Chime 2 and Data 2. Um, and there's also an option for ITS uh, with Data2, and there's also an option for Mother, but I, I haven't actually ever used the Mother pipeline on the Feli. Um, I generally run both Data2 and Chime2 because they give out a lot of overlapping uh, files, so a lot of it's kind of um, um, uh, redundant, but Data2 creates some files that I like uh, that Chime2 doesn't, and the same with Chime2. So it's no extra effort for me to run both the Data2 pipelines and the Chime2 pipelines, and then I get everything I want. Um, and so that's that's fine to do it that way, or you can just you know, know which one you like the best and, and just go ahead and use that. But let me go ahead with uh, Data2 for a minute. And again, um, that's a little pokey here. Um, this is, again, the same steps that you'll recognize from last week. Uh, we're going to do uh, paired end files, um, which are in my Google Drive. And I'm going to write, find the right folder eventually, maybe. There we go. Um, Um, and so here are my FASTQ files. And so I'm going to continue. And then I need to choose uh, my mapping file. And there is my uh, mapping file. OK. And I upload those. And then again, um, there. what this screen is telling me is what are the various things that are going to take place during data two, OK? And uh, some of these you'll see um, are redundant, again, from the QC step. So there's there tends to be redundancies in these pathways in terms of joining ends and so forth, or maybe re removing uh, low quality sequences and so forth. Um, and if you want uh, more information, you can uh, click on uh, see the details. If my page opens up, well, I'm not going to tax it too much, but you can see details there. And if you hit select, um, again, you have an option to do trimming or things like that here if you want. Um, but I usually stick uh, with the, the defaults if my data is already coming in um, 
cleaned up or if I've cleaned it up in the QC stage. And so then here I would put in um, a little bit of information that will help me identify this run uh, uh, later on. I'm not using IM torrent data, so I'm going to skip that. Um, I'm going to skip the merging and, and the quality stuff because these files have already gone through the, the quality analysis. And again, down here, um, I can choose if I want to use the RDP or a different database uh, for the assignments. I'll stick with the RDP. Um, you can choose the reference database. Um, I think I think we mentioned, I think Silva is more frequently updated than green genes. So um, we usually stick with uh, Silva. Um, I believe the bootstrap value at 40. And like I said, uh, when you're just going started, there isn't really a reason to um, change from the default settings. And then I will validate and submit. And just like it did last week, um, I'm getting a notification that's being sent to my email that says that this has been submitted. And again, depending on you know how much usage and how big my files are, I will get a response uh, from the Feli. Could be 10 minutes, 10 hours. Um, usually, most things, if, if they don't get hung up, uh, come back within 24 hours, uh, but trying to predict it's a, it's a little tricky. Uh, and then I'll get my data two files back. Okay. Any any questions with that? Because again, that's like those series of steps are the same for QC, same for analysis, same for explore. Um, um, just one one quick question in the chat. Um, so Lisa is asking about the mapping file and where it is located in the drive. She, she can't seem to locate it. Oh, um, so let me see. It should be. In this, uh, I guess this is called the ASM Remnet Webinar Files Fall 2003, and it's this Excel spreadsheet called ASM 2023 Webinar Metadata. Um, now, if, if you're using, this works with the FASTQ files that are in this folder. Um, if you're using your own FASTQ files, obviously you'll have to, you can use this as a template, but then you'd have to modify the file names to match yours. Does that answer the question? Okay, great. Um, right, so uh, let's now, again, jump ahead because I've already um, run data two. And so here are the outputs that are gonna come from data two. And uh, again, you could access these through your uh, home work page or your, I can't remember what Nefeli calls it, but your basically your work page from Nefeli. Uh, I've already downloaded it to the Google Drive, so that's where I'm accessing it now. Again, uh, what's, the, what's the most important file I'm going to look for if I have questions about this run? Are people chatting it in? Yeah, uh, Laura's got it. She was she gets a gold mark for her log. The log. log. File. So in addition to that log file link being in the email they send you, that log file is also going to be in this folder. And you can uh, click it there. And um again, you might be able to if, if something didn't go right, you might be able to identify it right here. But like I said, if you look for help, people will probably want to see that log file. Um, there is a good question, though. Um, I answered it in the chat, but I think the rest of them might need to know. Is, is If you change the input files, as in you're using the trim version instead, what would happen to the mapping file? Um, so you just need to check, um, and I can't remember if the... Uh, I can go back and check. Let's see. Um, so I was saying that you wanted to use the merge ones. You're talking about at this step? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so you would need to uh, rename 
your input files to match the ones that you're going to use here. So this, um, you can see, instead of having the original name, now it has this merged, so forth. Okay, so you would need to uh, just um, take the file names from this output folder and paste them into your uh, mapping file. But that's an excellent point. That because if if you if you did if you didn't do that, it would immediately tell you that it can't find these files in your folder. And that's because the file names have changed. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. Um, yes, that's okay. a first question. Aaron's just asking you, you use the folder if it has extra files. It doesn't matter. It's going to find the file that you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. If there are extra files or subdirectories in there, that's not an issue. But if anything is missing that you've included in your mapping file, then then that will raise a, an error, and then you'll have to just find whichever file's missing and put that in, or, or you know make the appropriate edit. Um, okay, so a couple other things. There, there's a lot here, and it can be a little overwhelming. Um, and, but I encourage you to kind of play around and take a peek at all these other files. The ones that I'll point out to you uh, that I think are uh, very useful are the .biome file. Um, so when we go to the explore step uh, in a little bit, you need to know where that .biome file is. Um, and you also need to know the sequence file, the .fasta file. And... Um, And in this uh, file of file, if you decide to do um, any analyses that require a, a tree, um, then you'll need to um, find your tree. And that's also in the output files. And in, and for, for basic studies like this, you're going to choose the unrooted tree. And I'll get back to these uh, later when we, when we get to it. But I just wanted to let you know that, uh, again, there's lots of stuff here, but the, those are the those are the ones that, at least for what we'll talk about in this uh, webinar, are the ones that you might need to go back to. And, and, and again, you can get out of Nefeli and you can use other tools uh, with the outputs that are generated uh, through Nefeli. So you could, you know, feed a taxa.biome file into a number of programs uh, or your uh, FASTA file. Uh, again, you don't have to do, if you're comfortable going outside of Nefeli, that's fine. You can use these same files. Um, all right, so uh, one of the things that, uh, again, if you're if you're not you know, spending a lot of time on this, if this is just one component of what you're working on with the students, one of the nice things with, uh, or one of the differences between the outputs for data two and um, Chime 2 is Data2 has some um, graphs that you can look at immediately. Uh, for Chime 2, when we get to it, I'll show you there's one uh, bar plot that you can access immediately, but the other visualizations, you need to go on to the explore step. And so if you don't have time for that, sometimes Data2 is just a little easier to use because you get some graphs right after running Data2. So if you go into that graphs uh, folder, um, you can see uh, that you have um, uh, you have alpha diversity, uh, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So any of these that are HTMLs, uh, you can open up and you can look at, uh, in this case, alpha diversity. And um, I'm not really in love with the way that Nefeli has this set up because it uses data two and it just kind of picks some of the um, variables in your metadata file and creates um, a whole set of different uh, alpha diversity graphs. So you can see we have Shannon's and Chow uh, one, which are the two, two, two alpha diversity metrics. And it's a comparing a couple of the groups that were in our samples like leaf to soil, um, comparing by dates. And, and, you know, whatever, I don't find this to be, you know, to have this kind of whole slew of different graphs, particularly useful, especially since they're so cramped. 
but they are there uh, right quick if you want them without having to go to the explore step. Um, and where was I? And that's also the same. So like if you look at uh, where's the rarefaction, um, so there's a rarefaction curve uh, that you can look at right away, uh, which can also be helpful. Uh, and remember that um, if you haven't done these uh, samples or if you haven't worked with these data before, uh, the rarefaction kind of gives you a sense of um, how much uh, of the diversity in your sample are you likely to be looking at? Are you looking at most of the diversity or only a small fraction of it? Um, and so I'm going to jump back to the PowerPoint now for a minute because I got the images look a little bit nicer there. But I just wanted to show you that all of these HTML files that are in that data uh, to output folder, you can go ahead and, and grab them right away and, and download them. You see you have some options uh, up here. I've never actually worked in Plotly, but if that's something that, have you, have you used Plotly? Yeah, it's pretty and it's easy for the students. And they okay. really like so you can go ahead and do that. Um, but let me any let me pause again. Any questions or anything? Yeah, okay. So, um, and we just I just added I added it to Gina that we'll make a meta file for all of you, a mapping file with the merged version, so you can see what it looks like. Just so you can know exactly what we're talking about, so you don't get confused. Yeah. We'll add that to the list. <laughs> a, it's a little always trickier than what you think. Those mapping I know, files, I know, but you had kind of have to struggle through it, but. Uh, You'll get it. Um, so I just wanted to, um, before we kind of get into this, this, you know, now we've just kind of opened up this huge doorway to all sorts of quantitative and statistical analyses you can do with your students. Um, and again, like I said, we do this in the context of a micro course or a general bio course. So it's not a bioinformatics class. It's not a biostatistics class. It's, this is just, you know, a couple of weeks that we're spending on this within the context of a micro lab. And so what I've found is very helpful for students, uh, you know, explaining some of these uh, statistical concepts that they may not have seen before is to use a uh, stat quest. Um, and there's also another one called math bench that also has a lot of these, but math quest uh, has a YouTube channel and um, pretty much, you know, the basic alpha diversity, beta diversity, lots of different things have five to eight minute um, uh, videos that kind of clearly explain them. Uh, and I think um, it's a real great tool, especially if you're not you know, familiar with teaching the statistics yourself, you might want to use that. So I'm going to throw out a plug for StatQuest. Um, and here again is the, the data to outputs file that we just went through. Um, so I won't spend any time here. Um, and here is again the rarefaction curve. And um, I don't know how many of you have been to any type of a statistics workshop where they did the M, &M game with you. And uh, you kind of, this is kind of giving you a sense of how much do you really need to sample. And you reach into a brown bag and you pull out MMs and you see, you know, what kind of diversity do you have after pulling out five MMs or 25 MMs and so forth. And so that uh, translates very nicely to. Uh, the number of number of times you pick an M&M, &M, that's equivalent to the sequence depth or the number of reads you're analyzing. And then the, the colors, the different colors of the M&Ms uh, translate to how many different uh, taxa do you have in your sample. So again, these are actually ASVs. Uh, they haven't updated it. I still have OTUs. But anyways, we can just think of um, the y-axis as being the number of um, different tags that we have in our sample. And the easiest way to kind of in, interpret these is that, um, like is the case for most of the uh, curves here, if they're plateauing, then you're pretty close to getting most of the diversity that uh, is in that sample. Uh, but if the samples are still kind of going up, um, then you may want to, like, let's say you only did 10,000 reads and your curve is still going up, then you'll probably identify a good number more taxa if you were to do 20,000 reads. But you can see here at even 10,000 reads, um, you know, if we did 
20,000 or 100,000, we might pick up an extra tax or two, but because um, these uh, are pretty much you know, going asymptotic, we're not likely to get that much more. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. But again, this may be just something that you wanna know for your own um, understanding about the samples, or it may be something that you want the students to learn as well. Um, just a quick quick question from the trap chat, Theo. Um, Erin is having trouble when she's clicking on the HTMLs. She's not seeing anything at all. Uh, no data. Okay. It's from our folder? I think it's from our folder. You're using our folder, right, Erin? She's saying um, yeah. Okay. So... I, it, you might have seen on mine, I'm, I'm using a Chrome browser, and when I click on them, there's a little intermediate step is like, do you want to open this up in Chrome? And then I click yes. Um, so, you know, Mac, Chrome um, seems to go okay on my end. I haven't, I'm, it also works the same from my laptop, which is also a Mac, which is also, I'm working with Chrome. Uh, we can look into it if you let us know. Uh, what hardware you have and what your browser is, but that's most likely the, the issue. Um, you could try just, um, you know, copying the file and then opening it manually uh, in your browser. Uh, but let us know what you're using and we'll, we'll try to see, you know, if it's a browser issue, which is what I suspect. Um, yeah, so um, I think that, these samples, again, right off the bat with a little bit of data that you're getting out of, well, it's a lot of data, but even with um, without digging in too far to use those alpha diversity numbers that you get um, and talk about biodiversity with your students. And again, my students have taken cell and molecular biology and intro bio, but they haven't gotten ecology or things like that. So they may not be that familiar with biodiversity. So I usually start with some examples um, that they might be familiar with. And I talk about Prospect Park, which is the nearest park uh, to campus that's right here in the center of Brooklyn. And I talk about, you know, an example, like if you were to look at the north half of the park, and if you take 20 minutes uh, on your own, and you're walking um, from one edge of the park to the other on that north end, counting the numbers of trees uh, and birds that you see. And then you, if you can see here, down here, those results, I see 25 species. Now, if I'm on the south half of the park and I take not 20 minutes, but two hours, and I'm going back and forth, and it's not just me, it's also I have a, an ornithologist friend and a botanist friend, and I'm counting the same things. Now I see uh, 60 species in the south half of the park. So you could ask, you know, does that mean that the south of that south half of the park has greater biodiversity? Well, probably not. Uh, and that's because the, the methods that we use to measure those biodiversities were different in the north and the south half. And so I equate in this example, the time, 20 minutes is like looking at, you know, 200 reads, okay? Whereas if I look, if I take two hours to go through there, that's maybe like looking at 20,000 reads, okay? So that's kind of relative to the depth uh, that you're looking. So if you're looking more deeply, you're gonna potentially see more different species there. And then in terms of, you know, just me, who's not a trained, you know, I'm a trained cell biologist, right? I can't identify trees, I can't identify birds or insects or what have you. So. I might just say, oh, there's a bird, there's another bird, there's a tree, there's another tree. So I have things that vary, you know, broad taxonomic groups, maybe at the level of, you know, phylum or what have you. So there aren't, you know, I'm just looking at these broad categories. But if I go through with experts, then I can get, I can get the bluebird, I can get the hummingbird, I can get the cardinal, I can get the elm, I can get the oak. And so I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing more diversity and that's related to maybe, the database that you're comparing to, like how how full is how complete is that database? Can you really identify all the diversity in your sample? And so again, in this like very straightforward example, um, I can get across the the ideas of you know what does it mean to sequence more deeply? What does it mean to kind of uh, use a better um, 
uh, database that's been um, uh, updated to very specific levels. Or, or you could also equate that to um, oops, sequence length, so that um, if you're only looking at 100 base pairs, that's not necessarily enough information to get from um, order, or you, you can't get much further than order. But if you're using 250 base pairs, you could get to genus. Um, and so those are uh, ways to kind of look at that. Um, so these I, I showed you. And um, again, these are the outputs that come straight from uh, data two. And again, in terms of learning objectives, we like to you know, um, ask the students to be able to interpret these, uh, these graphs you know, tell us which sample do they think is diverse, which sample is not so diverse. Uh, maybe they can speculate about um, why they might be more or less diverse uh, and things like that. Um, and so that's kind of just, you know, basic, um, some of the basic things. The other uh, Questions that you can ask about these alpha diversity numbers have to do with uh, richness and evenness. So the richness is the overall uh, diversity and the evenness is kind of how um, equally spread they are. And so here I just, you know, using that same Prospect Park example of the North and the South half, I have, if you look down here, there are 12 species were identified uh, in both the north and the south half, and the total number of observations was close to 90. So you could say that, okay, uh, 12 species in each, uh, close to 90 observations in each, the north and the south half are uh, of equivalent diversity. But if you look at um, the north half, you can see that you know, most of the observations were like house sparrows or starlings um, and a lot of maple trees and a bunch of humans. Okay, so most of my observations fell into those four categories. Whereas if you look on the south side, you know, I, I don't, I have more of an even distribution. I saw a lot of house sparrows and starlings, but I also saw a lot of spruce trees, a bunch of squirrels and so forth. And so this, on the south half, it's less uneven. And so, when you're using um, metrics like uh, Shannon or Simpsons, which take into account um, evenness, then you would see that the um, south half of the park would have a higher biodiversity measurement by these indices that take, into, take that evenness into account. Whereas like a direct species count or Chow one, which don't factor in evenness, are going to say that those two samples uh, are equivalent. And you can also, again, I think another, again, uh, my students uh, typically have not worked with Excel a lot, have not made a lot of graphs. So if we have an opportunity to get them to do that, then we'll take that opportunity. And so one of the easy things that you can have them to do with just this uh, alpha diversity data is to make a rank abundance curve. Um, and here, what I just described, you can see that showing up in the sense that here, uh, this I'm colorblind, but I think this is some kind of yellowy green. Um, a lot of the samples are are you know giving me my species count up above 25, close to 30, my house sparrow, my starlings, and then that line drops off and stays relatively low for these other species. Whereas uh, the back uh, ribbon the darker green, you know, again, those species are the most abundant, but it's not quite so dramatic. And so that curve, instead of being, you know, very sharp, is kind of a little uh, less deep, uh, indicating that it's um, more even or less uneven. Uh, and again, um, if you do that for the actual data that's in your file, it's even more dramatic. Um, and you can see, um, again, uh, that these samples, okay, these are, are soil samples, um, but it's true of most of the complex microbiome samples that you're likely to work with, is that they are, well, who, who wants to guess? Uh, is this very 
even or very uneven? People chiming in on the chat. I'm watching. I'm watching. I think Laura, Laura got it last time. So let's see if she can get it this time. <laughs> They're all very quiet. Okay. Wait now. Oh. Uneven. Francine says uneven. Okay. Excellent. So these are very uneven. Um, but that's that's not atypical. This is very typical of, of a soil sample and even water samples and swabs that we've done from buildings. Um, this is looking at the level of uh, phyla. You can see the phyla listed here along the x-axis. And the vast majority of my reads are falling into these first uh, four or five categories into actinobacteria, proteobacteria, acidobacteria, firmicutes, okay? Um, that probably accounts, just those three phyla probably account for 90% or more of the total reads in my sample. Now, all told, I didn't count these up, but there's probably like maybe 25 phyla represented, which is great. So there's lots of diversity there that covers a a whole lot of branches uh, on the bacterial uh, phylogenetic tree, but most of these phyla are very uncommon. So I might have a few reads from those, but but not many at all. Um, and so, again, I think that uh, you know doing these rank abundance curves, especially if your students you know need some uh, practice doing graphing and stuff, uh, are really really um, powerful tools to kind of demonstrate these um, ideas of evenness um, and richness and so forth. And then the, the last thing I'll mention in regards to alpha diversity metrics uh, is adding in uh, phylogenetic distance. Um, and so again, here I use, you know, from, because we're in New York City, I'll use the Bronx Zoo as an example. And I talk about going to either the um, Madagascar exhibit or to the aviary. And in both, uh, the aviary and the Madagascar exhibit, you count uh, 10 species and you count one member of each of those species, okay? So the richness is 10 uh, and there's one of each. So the evenness is one. So that's as even as you can get. And using those data, you would say by both, um, by both a richness measure like child one or one that includes evenness like Shannon's, you would say that those two samples were uh, equally, equivalently biodiverse. Um, but if you use a phylogenetic tree and look to see how closely related are your samples, in the Madagascar exhibit, you have maybe reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, so forth. Uh, but in the aviary, um, you all have birds, okay? So they're coming some, from one very relatively narrow branch of the tree. And so if you include these phylogenetic measures, uh, such as Faith's PD, which is one of the outputs that you get from Chime 2 or Unifrac, uh, these are diversity measurements that include uh, a mapping tree and can uh, add, basically they're measuring up uh, branch distances on those trees and they can tell you this kind of element of phylogenetic diversity. Uh, and so I think that's important to kind of convey to students. All right, uh, any kind of questions before I move on from uh, alpha diversity? Okay, oops. Um, and so here is, uh, again, just some more of what you can do. Um, and I'll get back to this when we talk a little bit from the Chime 2 outputs, uh, because I think I'm looking at uh, Faith's PD, which is one of the outputs from uh, Chime 2 is uh, here are the data that come out in that file, these first two columns in the spreadsheet A and B. And then I pasted in some of my metadata so I know what those are. Um, and then I've made this uh, jittered scattered bar plot. Again, this is a little more of a complex uh, graph, but again, it, it really shows all your samples. It shows you, again, looking at Faith's PD, uh, that the leaf litter uh, scores the lowest in diversity, uh, and then the sediment, and then the soil has the greatest uh, diversity using this. Um, and I'll pause here for a second. Um, like I said, uh, we in the lab use uh, Excel because all the students have 
access to Excel through the campus. If, if they've used any spreadsheet and graphing program, 90% of them uh, will have used Excel. So even though uh, R is gonna do a much better job at a lot of these graphs and give you lots more flexibility, we don't, because we don't have time to teach them how to use R because it's in a micro class, we wanna start with something that they already know and we wanna start with something that they might use in other classes outside of microbiology. So we've made a strategic decision uh, to stick with Excel in this case. Um, if uh, for next week, people, you know, are not familiar with, you know, how these graphs are made and you want us to go over that, I'm happy to, to do that. But I, you know, some of you probably will blow my socks off with your Excel talent and don't need me to waste your time showing you how to make a, a graph like this. But if the, you know, if, if you as a, as a group think that that would be useful, I'm happy to do it. I'm not, not gonna do it right this sec, but we'll wait to hear back from you. And if it is, we can build it into uh, next week. Um, but I'm just kind of showing you as again, like that we can do the rank abundance curve as well, um, if these things are, are helpful. So I'll just, for the moment, I'll just leave. Oh, the last thing I'll mention is that built into Excel, you can also do like a t-test, you can do ANOVA. So if you wanna go into some, uh, a little more advanced um, community analysis, you can uh, do that as well. And I've, I've shown those uh, down here. Okay. All right, this we did. Um, now, moving from uh, alpha diversity into uh, beta diversity, uh, one of the outputs that comes uh, directly out of data two are these PCOA plots, these principal coordinate analyses. And um, again, there's some nice discussions of these on StatQuest. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about these because I actually prefer the PCOA plots that come out of Chime 2. So I'll show you those in a minute, um, but you can get them out of data two. And th these are kind of um, the ones that are from the files that we have. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears a bit uh, if there aren't any questions and I'm gonna move to Chime 2. Uh, is there a question there? Yeah, so a couple of important ones. So Zamina was asking about the graphs that you just showed. They were in Excel, they weren't in R. But then Jorge asked about the diversity statistics that we're making and they're being generated in Chime and Data too, right? And if so, do they always agree with one another? Okay, so break that down a bit for me again. Uh, so the diverse, uh, Zamina's core, uh, question was with, with respect to you using Excel, which you did, you used Excel. Yeah. That was out of the way. Jorge asked about the diversity values that we were talking about, if they were Chime data to generated, and if so, did they agree with one another? Okay, so um, this, this what we're looking at right here is Faith's PD, and I don't think that's one of the outputs of uh, data two, but things like Shannon, Simpsons, Chow One, there's Ace, there's, there's a whole handful of, um, alpha diversity measurements, you can Google the calculation. So whether it's data two or, or chime two, they're using the same calculation under the hood. And even, I, I, I okay, I haven't actually gone to check directly, but they should be, if you've used the same data files, they should give you the same, um, say, Chow Wan or, or Shannon's value output. Because again, keep in mind that you know, Nefeli is packaging pipelines from a whole bunch of sources. Chime 2 and Data 2 are implementing tools, are, again, that are have already exist. And so those calculations um, for something like, you know, Shannon, it's it's a formula that is going to be the same one used by, by both those pipelines. So um, if, if you did see a difference, it would probably be uh, something to do with... Um, uh, I, I don't know. I'd have to look, but I expect that they would be the same. Does that answer the question? And uh, you can, um, you know, uh, for uh, for Shannon's, that's a pretty simple equation. You can take your counts and you can do Shannon. Uh, I don't think it's built into um, Excel, but you can just type in the formula 
and you'll get the same value. And I that I have tried, and that does work. So the numbers aren't being pulled out of thin air. Okay. Um, so I'm going to uh, just where am I? Okay. Okay. So um, to get the additional files from um, Chime 2, you need to uh, use the Explore pathway. Um, that's right here. Uh, we'll try to talk about PyCrust next week if people are interested. Uh, but again, both of those are in the Explore uh, segment of Nefeli. And I'll just kind of, I won't do it, but I'll just show you that it's exactly um, the same steps. But remember, I told you about those couple extra files. So here it's asking for that biome file. So for uh, here, I'm going to choose um, if I can find it. So here, uh, Chime 2 calls this a little bit different. It calls it the feature table dot biome, but it's a dot biome file. So that's the one I the, that's the one I'm going to direct it to, and then uh, it's going to ask me for my mapping file. I'm not going to do that because that's the same. And then it's going to ask me uh, for that. Um, well, I'll just go ahead and show you if it's not my computer is being a little bit slow. So oop, I got to choose it. Um, There's the mapping file. Um, and then I'm going to use this uh, tree.nwk. Um, OK, and so then I can go forward. But that's all you need to do for the Explorer. Again, just remember, you've got those files. Don't be surprised. Um, OK. And so let's assume that I continued and went ahead and run that. Um, I'm going to get my explore output files. And those are all listed here. And again, uh, you'll find your log file in here if you have any issues. Um, there's a lot of stuff that, that comes out in this explore file. Um, but actually, I'm reminding myself, I jumped ahead a little bit. Um, if I go to uh, the time to uh, analyze file, and this is the one that comes out in the first step, it doesn't have all the alpha diversity measurements and it doesn't have any PCOA plots, but uh, there are some uh, very valuable files that are here uh, in this uh, time to analyze output. Uh, output folder. And just very quickly, what I'll tell you is that anything um, that ends in QZV is a uh, Chime 2 view viewable file. Okay. And you'll see that there are uh, a bunch of these QZV files. Okay. And so uh, but I had this open somewhere, but maybe I don't. Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, so if you go to Chime 2 View, if you just Google that and click it, it'll take you to this uh, landing page. And you can either drag in those files or I'll uh, do it this way. Um, and here I'm going to that same folder. So here's my uh, Chime 2 analyze output files. And um, the only ones that I can open are those QZV ones. And so just so I, you know, Theo, when you when you're using the pop-ups, we're not seeing them. So oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. Okay. It's okay. So anyways, I'm gonna open up uh, <laughs> the, um here is the rarefaction curve that comes out of um the Chime 2 pathway. Uh looks very similar. You can play around with a little bit more. So this is kind of um, fun, it's doing it in Faith PD, but you can do observed features or 
Shannon's um, and so forth. So uh, that's cool. Um, you can also, and again, it, now, now that I know that you can't see this, um, what I think is really nice, uh, and again, this comes right out of um, trying to analyze is the bar plot. And believe me, you could get a whole, uh, maybe even a semester's worth of work out of just the data that, that's right here, okay? Um, and I'll just take the last few minutes to give you kind of a teaser for, for what's in here, but this is these are relative abundance bar plots, okay? And so if you see down here on the x-axis, those are our samples, and on the y-axis is the relative abundance, okay? Um, and so you can see I'm at the kind of uh, the uppermost level, level one is just telling me that most of my reads are bacteria. I have a few archaea uh, scattered in there. If I go to level two, here are all my phyla. Okay, so it starts to look really cool. And I don't recommend it, but you know, you can go to uh, genus and you get the rainbow. Uh, so lots of fabulous stuff there. But I, I normally stick um, unless my samples are not that diverse or not that complex, I usually start out at the phylum level. And so here are all my phyla listed there. And I can um, sort by, uh, I think there were some depths in, in this, uh, in my mapping file. So I have samples that were collected at five centimeters and samples that were collected at 80 centimeters. Okay, and so right off the bat, you can see, oh, there look like there's some significant differences between the shallow samples and the deep samples. If I look at um, sample type, okay, so which is my least diverse, my lowest alpha diversity of any of my sample types, leaf, sediment, or soil? First two on the left. Yeah, those two, those are my leaf samples, right? So for whatever reason, very, you know, almost everything is in this uh, uh, cyanobacteria. That's probably uh, my chloroplasts, which you could filter out. Um, anyway, so lots that you can do uh, right here. Um, and uh, a couple of the other things you can do is you can say you want to just um, focus on one of the phyla, you can isolate uh, one or um, a couple phyla and kind of get, you know, cool looking graphs like this. Also, if you hover over the bars, you'll see above here, it's telling me like, okay, that these, uh, what are these, acidobacteria make up, you know, in this case, 41% of the diversity in my, in my sample. So, um, you know, just by hovering over, you can get a lot of information. And the last thing uh, that I'll show you, and we'll talk about this more next week, is that you can uh, download this if you just click on that CSV, and that'll download it uh, as a CSV file, which you can open in Excel. And then this graph, you can recreate in Excel, and you can do exactly what you want. Like, so let's say if you wanted to filter out something or you wanted to remove some samples because they were part of a different experiment and you didn't want them to, you know, to be here. Um, you can do everything you want within that uh, Excel file. Um, okay. So um, I know that was a lot. Hopefully um, I, I get really excited when we get into all these data because there's just so much there. And I, I love to make graphs. I could do, I, I do, and I could do all day. Um, so so one of the one of the pressing questions from the folks is just would you mind very quickly showing them the drive as to where you got the files for explore and then show them the QZV file locations for chime to view just if you can show them your drive specifically yeah so um this is the folder and i i didn't i forgot uh, that you don't see my pop up windows but when i was going to um when I was going to Chime 2 view and clicking on here, it was taking me um, to, I was picking the folder 
and all of these uh, QZV. So here is the alpha rarefaction that I showed you. And here is the taxa bar plot, the one that we just looked at. Um, next week, I'll show you a little more about the taxonomy, RepSec, and, and those files as well. And um, yeah, but th that's where they are. And what else did you want to see? The, the input files for Explore. Because you mentioned the new, remember you mentioned the tree file and other things and you were showing. For Explore. Yes, for Explore. Okay. So uh, here is the unrooted tree file, the tree.nwk. Uh, so you'll want that. And the other one you need is the biome file, which is somewhere in here. Can anyone see it? It's it's probably at the there at the bottom. I can't see it because all the way at the all the way at the bottom. Okay, so it's all it's covered up by some other window here. But uh, anyways, that dot biome file is the other one that you need, and then the mapping file. Yeah. Does that answer those questions? Yep. Um, and then folks are just asking a couple of other questions about um, uh, how to, basic stuff like how to get started all together. So a little bit people are a little bit lost. So we'll share with you. We have like basic manuals and stuff. We'll share with you so you can kind of catch up for next week. Suggest so watching the videos really slowly, um, and then coming to us with specific questions. And then Laura did ask about um, Laura and Miranda asked about species resolution if it's possible with what we're doing. Um, no. <laughs> um, and then Miranda asked about the can you average out the groupings like instead of having them separated based on sample can you have the two leaf samples in one bar and the many soil samples in one bar um, not not through chime 2 view but if you like I said if you download that CSV file you can collapse things and, and average exactly so one of the things that would be helpful for us if you can you know respond uh, to Rachel or respond to us um, or even in the chat in the next minute or so, you know, is it going to be valuable to people if I show some stuff in Excel or are people beyond Excel and really don't want their time wasted with Excel and just want to focus on other outputs? And, and of course, you know, we might have a little bit of both, but um, <clears throat> I'm, uh, it, it's, you know, not always easy to judge kind of what people will find uh, the most useful. Um, but again, in, in terms of, um, of being overwhelmed, uh, there is a lot of stuff that comes out. Uh, but basically, um, I, I never, I didn't take a course, I didn't take a workshop. The way that I learned almost all of this is just clicking on files and, and playing around. Anytime I see something that I don't recognize, I Google it. Um, talking to colleagues like Davida, unfortunately or fortunately, there's no real uh, substitute for playing around with the stuff. Um, we uh, will do our best to kind of help you over the hurdles and, and show you what we think is important. Um, but if you if you really want to get the most out of it, you know, play around, play around with our files, run it yourself, play around with your own files. Um, you know, but much to my wife's chagrin, I'm always sitting around the dinner table, opening up files and getting lost for a half an hour, an hour, just kind of fiddling with stuff. So um, that's best, the best way to learn it. Um, and there was just one, one thing that's going to bother some of the folks is the fact that they're opening files and seeing nothing. And um, so I think there's not just one person that's having a problem. There's a couple of them that are having the same problem. So. Maybe if you could all hang back, hang back for a few minutes after the webinar, and we'll try and tackle that if we can. Especially, let us know what your um, browser and uh, platform are. Rachel, do you have any closing words? Okay, closing words. Um, first, are please take our post webinar surveys for every single webinar. Um, <clears throat> it's a quick four question. It'll take you probably a minute or two. And your um, input is very valuable to ASM and the facilitators. Um, number two, our next webinar will be uh, Wednesday, October 25th, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. And then the final one after that will be uh, Wednesday, November 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern. And um, if you want to contact me, um, education at asmusa.org. And with that, I'll stop the recording and uh, you can stay on if you have um, individual questions for our facilitators.